artists that are the most successful work the hardest. I've seen Jay-Z do it. I've never seen anybody work harder than Beyonce. What is it about these books? You know this, you, you know the answer. The pursuit of excellence, the passion for doing what they do supersedes any financial reward. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, very special guest for you here today. Uh, somebody I've known for a while uh, and followed for an even really long, a much longer time, uh, the one and only Steve Stout. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, I feel great being here. I, I know that we're going to get into some nice meaty topics, <laughs> as you always get into meaty topics, like <laughs> rustling. In tech. <laughs> you, yeah. you see the belt, the belt. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, so I don't know if you can see this. Right there behind me over there is the classic winged eagle belt uh, from the 90s. But uh, we're going to get to that in just a bit because I want to talk about pro wrestling. But first, maybe for our audience, uh, you know, I was doing a prep and you have a huge Wikipedia page. Yes. So much more about you. Have, you know, your story is so interesting. There is no possible way we can do a two line, three line intro. Yeah. So, Tell us who you are, tell us the audience who you are and what you work on because there are so many interesting things in there. Well, you know, I started my career in the music business. I started as a as a record executive manager and a record executive at Sony Music. Um, I held big titles at Sony uh, back in the 90s and then I went to Interscope under Jimmy Iovine. Mm -hmm. I worked very closely with Jimmy Iovine for many years and then I left and I went into the advertising business in, in 2002. In the advertising business, I built the agency Translation. I wanted to work on my own and build something that was transformative. And, you know, my perspective was that culture was more important than demography. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard to explain that to media at large back in 2004. It's still an uphill climb now, but that was the premise of Translation, to translate culture for Fortune 500 companies. And then in 2016, I had the idea to disrupt the music business, the business that I came from. Uh, as music went digital, I wanted to uh, create a self-serve platform for artists called United Masses so that the artists would own and retain their rights and have something to pass along to their kids, their family, um, rather than what the incumbent industry did would take those rights mm -hmm. and uh, take them from the artists and own them. Um, so we allow artists to now own their rights um, and we distribute 1.9 million artists. I'm proud to say that Andreessen Horowitz is uh, uh, one of our investors and in, um, Apple and Google uh, are both uh, investors of our company. And we've made significant strides over the last uh, uh, three, four years. Uh, um, we're going to get into a lot of that, uh, but... You know, one of the things is, you know, I was kind of bent on this rabbit hole looking up and we kind of known each other professionally as friends a little bit, but I learned so much of more of your history. And one of the things I like about you is you have so many interesting life and career lessons about yep. how to do business. And a lot of people usually have it from one domain, but you have it both from the world of culture and music, but also from the world of entrepreneurship and tech, which I think is fairly unique. Talk to us about being fired by RCA and how that was maybe one of the best things that ever happened to you? There was a producer I wanted to meet mm -hmm. and uh, I was trying to set time with for a while and he would cancel the meeting and cancel the meeting and then I ran into him at the mall um, and I said, look, can you meet me? And I'm like, I pinned him down. I'm like, bro, please, Tuesday, 11 a.m. meeting, please. Mm -hmm. Like you've canceled, like he goes, I'll be there. I swear to you, I'll be there. So I'm supposed to see him at 11, which is fine. And I have a meeting with my boss at noon. At noon, the guy comes in. He completely blows the 11. He's an hour late. And when he walks in my office, he's on the phone, the big ass cell phones back then, the brick phones mm -hmm. that were, you know, telephone booths next to your head. And I said to him, look, just wait here. I'll be right back. I got to have a meeting with my boss, but don't go anywhere. I'll be back. I was happy he showed up. I go have a meeting with my boss and he proceeds to tell me that they're letting me go. Um, and what was significant was the company quit on quote unquote black music at the time. Mm -hmm. They quit on rap music. They quit. They quit that they would be effective at selling rap or black music. 
uh, and they were focusing their efforts on country and pop music and other genres. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of winding down the all the all the all the black people. <laughs> um, so I go back to my office, and the guys there, and I'm like, "Well, there's nothing to talk about now. I just got." <laughs> And he goes, well, you know, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. He goes, well, why don't you manage me? Hmm. And that question and my answer, yes, changed my life dramatically. That producer was uh, Tone of the production group, the Trackmasters. Mm -hmm. right. And for those of you who don't know, the Trackmasters produced... 30 number one records between 1996 or 1995 and 1999. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. from Biggie, One More Chance mm -hmm. to LL Cool J's. Um, uh, I mean, like seven hits for Hey Lover and Mariah Carey. And yeah. Got Tupac changes, mm -hmm. um, Jay Z, yeah. you know, Michael Jackson, just monster hits. Um, and I'm very proud of that part of my life. And if it wasn't for Tone, who is the, was the best man at my wedding, um, I could say that I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for his decision um, to ask me to manage him after I just got let go. Let go. You know, I'm sort of laughing now because it's obvious that such a, we tell the story now and it's kind of, a, kind of a change in your life, which obviously worked out. But what was your emotion in the moment, right? Uh, because the reason I ask is we have a lot of people listen who go through adversity who may have been fired, who may have been laid off, or maybe they didn't close that fundraising round or something happened. What was your... And then in that moment, it's not always clear that you're going to make it and how that path out is going to look like. Uh, you know, it's 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 not fun living through it. In, the, in, in retrospect, it always is like, it somehow always works out. But how did it feel in that moment for you? It, it obviously sucks. Um, it was more... I didn't understand why they were getting rid of the black music department. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a chance to like really understand. Right. Like if I got fired because I was a poor performer, you when you're a poor performer, you know it's just a matter of time before you get caught. Let me, you know that. Yeah. I mean, you you're not stunned you got fired. Yeah. You know, you know, like you've been you've been getting away with murder for a while and someone caught you. <laughs> yeah. But when they say they're gonna get rid of the black music department, and you're like, Well, I don't understand that. That was the part that was more stunning to me than anything else. But I didn't feel, yeah, because of what they did, I didn't feel personally mm -hmm. like I was a failure. Right. So I didn't have any, it wasn't like I learned what to do differently. Right. Other than not work for anybody. Right. Makes sense. Like, yeah. I, I started to learn that. Um, and even when I took the next job, I almost convinced myself every day that it was my, I made my career, mm -hmm. my entrepreneurial effort. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I was doing it for me. Mm -hmm. And just changing it from doing it for the company to doing it for me mm -hmm. was very important to motivate me daily. Mm -hmm. And then I got the courage and the idea, you know, to go and become an entrepreneur for real without any, you know, sort of job security. Yeah. You've um, had the, you know, kind of this front seat access to go work with some of the greatest people of our generation, right? You're looking at like Nas, you're looking at JC, like all these folks. Most of us have only been like the spectator. We see like the the work and the products and the result, not so much like working with these people. Are they similar to each other? Are they very different from each other? What is it that is that would be surprising to people yep. like us who don't really work yeah. with them? The first thing I would tell you is like anything else in any other profession. And this is one of the greatest things that really connected Ben and I. The artists that are the most successful work the hardest. Mm -hmm. it, it is a universal truth. Mm -hmm. And when I say work hard, I mean work hard like you know, like you guys know what work hard means. Like the, like the engineer that's working, you know, 17 hour days yeah. with a founder who's working 17 hour days. It's the same level of work. I've seen Jay-Z do it. I've never seen anybody work harder than Beyonce, ever. Not anybody. Maybe Kobe Bryant, um, who I got a chance to work with. God bless. Uh, 
you know, Nas hard work, and these guys work hard. They, they, the, the travel, the writing, the uh, giving of yourself yeah. in order to find the stories of, to tell that truth. They work very, very hard. The real winners. Now there are other people mm -hmm. who've had overnight successes that mm -hmm. you know who did not work hard, but yeah. it just an idea worked and it su was successful. Uh, but there was no real follow up to that because they didn't ha develop the mm -hmm. the work ethic to um, to be able to understand what comes next and do all the work to make it to make what comes next go even further. Mm -hmm. The other thing I learned is that the engine that the producers, the Dr. Dre's, the Timberlands, um, the Swiss Beats, the Kanye West, the producers are very similar to engineers, mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm. There is, you take the greatest engineer from Meta yeah. or Google, and I'm telling you, that's Dr. Dre. The same amount of sensitivity, the same amount of motivation, it's not about money, mm -hmm. it's it's like literally, what is the mission that we're trying to accomplish, yep. and I yep. will do anything to get to that outcome. And they're doing it through music, and creating a song. And obviously an engineer is doing it through product and code. Yeah. But it's the exact same level of empathy and motivation. Like they're trying to change something. They're trying to change the sound on the radio. They're trying to disrupt the market from this the, the monotonous of what you hear all the time. The great producers are always trying to change music. Pharrell changed music four times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like that. That's a that's a dead. I'm gonna wake up in the morning and everything I hear in the radio, and everything I hear on playlisting or whatever it may be, or what's popping on the charts, I'm going to make something that's as popular that comes at it completely different. I want to ask you about actually Pharrell because that story on RCA I heard from your connection Pharrell, which we link to. It's fantastic. And as we are recording this, Pharrell just wrapped up a few weeks ago maybe one of the most iconic okay. LVMH uh, shows taking over the, the city of Paris. And I was struck by, here's a guy who's been at the top of his domain for maybe a couple of decades, and not just in music, but then transcended that into, you know, the human line, sneakers, and now, you know, as the creative director of probably one of the most iconic fashion houses in the world. And what I'm kind of jealous and kind of so curious about is he doesn't need the money, right? So what, but he's also reinventing himself all the time. So what about something like a Pharrell? I think something like a LeBron is a similar example. Keeps that internal motor going, but also they are constantly adapting and reinventing, reinventing themselves with the times. What is it about these books? It, you know this. You, you know the answer. You know the answer. I kind of said it, like the pursuit of excellence the passion for doing what they do supersedes any financial reward. They're trying to make a mark. They're building a legacy, but they're not doing it for that. They don't know how to stop. Mm. They don't know how to stop learning. They're culturally curious. They want to they wanna expand. Rakim says the line, constant elevation causes expansion. Constant elevation causes expansion. And it's the idea that keep elevating and then you expand as a, as a direct result of that elevation. And that's what they believe and that's how they approach the world. So, um, you know, I would say whether it be Pharrell, LeBron, Jay-Z, or whoever, the great producers, artists, entrepreneurs are constantly elevating. And that expansion is what we see. And you go, why are they doing that? And how could he go from making that song to now this LVMH fashion show or or this um this uh he built this uh this trading house that he has. Pharrell has his trading house hmm. or auction house rather, let me be more specific. And it's the it's the it's the constant pursuit and the cultural curiosity to keep mm -hmm. expanding or keep um elevating that that allows that to happen it's the same thing in, in in tech i mean 
when I speak to Ben, it's the same exact thing. Like, how are you doing this? And the firm's doing that. And the firm's now opening up in London. And the firm's, yeah. you know, the expansion um, of the firm and the categories that you guys are playing in and the gaming fund and everything else that you guys have done is about elevation. You know, I was listening to a bunch of your interviews and something which struck me, I should have interviewed, but it kind of struck me was you approach business relationships very similar to the firm. And I give, you know, obviously full credit to Ben and Mark and the culture they have set. Um, and so I was watching the the shop episode with you and Mav and Rich Paul. And there's a bit in there where you talk about how, you know, you manage some of the most famous people in the world, right? Like you, Mary J. Blige and Nas. And one thing that blew me away was you said, and I'm, I might be mistaken, but in fact, the, there is no written contract and you're not look, trying to make money off of each song because you're taking a long-term perspective. And I'm kind of curious to, you know, for folks listening to this, young entrepreneurs or people who just think of relationships, business, transactions, like that is such a fundamental level of insight, which I think goes to the heart of how we work as a firm in the place I work for. Um, talk to me a little bit about how those relations work for you and maybe how people should think about business relations. One of the things that I realized early was the access that these great artists provide you um, gives you an entree to another world. And although that you are the manager and you make money from each transaction, I always felt like because of the entree they provide, I could actually make money off of that outside of making money on them, which many managers do all the time. Yeah. Uh, once you get in the room, you start networking and you find other opportunities. So my only contribution to them or my contribution for, to them because they allowed me to be their manager and I got that access was to not charge them for everything. Mm. So what I talked about in that interview that you're referencing was publishing, which is basically getting paid off the, the things yeah. that you write. Mm. I never charged anybody a commission if I if I made them money off of something that they wrote. I, I just never did that. I also felt like I didn't wanna f have an artist feel like I'm giving you a contract and because you have this contract with me, you are now locked into this agreement and you can't leave me. Mm -hmm. I, I I didn't I didn't want them to feel that the that the weight of that. Mm -hmm. Um and I know most people think that that's not a good idea, and I understand why. The obvious thing is like because you can do all the work and then they'll leave you. Mm -hmm. But I also have so much pride and respect for my ability and what I bring to the table that I'm like, well, if they leave me, that means I left them. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Like that's that, that that's also not good for that. The way we see it, we call it the infinite game, right? Like you have zero sum games versus infinite games. Zero sum game is, you know, if for you to win, somebody else has to lose and think about it as like a transactional system, which is we see a lot of people playing that game and it's very short term focused. And then there is an infinite sum game, which is if somebody else wins, you can win with them. You can do with you can go partner with them, collaborate with them, and as the world gets better, everybody reaps the rewards for it. And that's kind of the game that I've seen successful people play and be really good at. Um, and those are like kind of the lessons that we try to talk about on this show as well. Yeah. Switching topics just a bit, you know, I think Shriram talked about Ben and. Uh, you, you know, working with, talking to, hanging out with Ben, like that's kind of how we've known each other for a while. Tell us, yeah. I guess, a story. Yeah, or yeah. Give, give us your favorite Ben, ben story. story. Something that'll get me in trouble for even talking about on this show. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything I can get you in trouble with. <laughs> I will tell you, I seen Ben do something that was early on in our relationship. It was crazy. He came to my house and uh, this is like, eight years ago, nine years ago. And he talked about his commitment. He's barbecuing. Ben is as committed as he is to his fun and all of our, you know, the money and everything he does and he invests as a, as a, as a, as a private equity, fund, as a venture capital fund, sorry. He is equally as committed to his barbecue. Yep. <laughs> so he comes by my house and I have a very BS barbecue. Of course, I don't have what he has. Yeah. 
you know, I got like the green egg, like, you know, the regular ass barbecue. And uh, <laughs> Ben is uh, like making the ribs, which he is pride and joy. And as he goes to take the ribs off, the, the grill goes like this. And he grabbed the damn, not to lose the ribs, he grabbed the grill with his bare hand, the end of it. I'm talking about this shit is scorching hot. Yeah. Oh. And he hit it with his bare hand just to keep it up, to not lose the ribs to the thing. And then the damn thing fell on his foot. And even without, with using his hand and it falling on his foot, he never once let the ribs get damaged in the process. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Like, literally, what is wrong with you? This is a, this is a fire. This is ashes. This is coal. Like, what are you, crazy? The coal hit your foot, you guts the girl with your bare head, and you're doing all this to save the rips? I knew this man was very serious about things. Yeah. <laughs> that was for that that was like ten years ago. I couldn't I look I looked at him like, who are you? Yeah, see <laughs> Sirius is one objective. There are other objectives, but Sirius is definitely one objective. <laughs> yeah. You don't know uh, this at home, kids. So that's a that's a yeah. that's a that's a Ben story. I, I think one thing about you and Ben and I mean like I think a lot of our listeners can look at you now and they see, you know, somebody near the, at the top of the mountain, right? Uh, but when I was kind of listening to some of your stories, it really impressed upon me, it's kind of the hustle and the grind. Uh, so talk to us a little bit, like if you're a founder watching this, being on planes, going to some one of these networking meetings, just to get one meeting, follow up, just the hustle, the grind in a shitty hotel room, what was it life like for you and how much is that a reason for who you are today? I'll give it to you twofold. When I first got, when I first met Ben in 2011, it was around, um, he had read my book, The Tanning of America. Mm -hmm. And I had done a, I was speaking at uh, Stanford mm -hmm. and somebody in attendance worked at the firm and said, you know, he would like to meet you. And do you like boxing? And then I went to his house, watched the boxing match and we became really good friends listening to rap music and drinking whiskey. And um, that was 2011. And by 2014, when I had the idea for what United Masters will ultimately be, but I started thinking about raising money, you know, Ben worked with me on help shaping the idea. And then I went out to raise the money and I raised the money and I had to build a team. You know, one thing Ben said to me is that if you, when you build United Masses, the thing that's going to work, that you got to have the tech advantage. Mm -hmm. And to have the tech advantage, you got to hire the best in class engineers. And I knew what that meant. I had to run the agency. So Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, I'd be in New York. Mm -hmm. And then Wednesday night, I'd take a nine o'clock flight to uh, the Bay. And then Thursday and Friday, and part of Saturday, I'd be in the Bay. And I did that for five years. And Everyone thought I'd go to the Warriors games, I would be out socially, and I would meet talent. I met, you know, a lot of early, you know, Travis and Drew and uh, Chris Cox at Facebook and, you know, all of the the the, the, the yeah. people. We're talking about 2016, 17, 18. And that was very important for me to understand the culture of the Valley. It was very important for me to understand the, you know, how to speak to an engineer. That's when I realized engineers and producers were very similar. I had to integrate myself into the, you know, the ways of the Valley in order to be able to recruit talent and develop a network, which I'm proud that I've done. But that was the grind. Like that was like, and I had learned that to be, I was able to do that because in the record business mm -hmm. early on or the advertising business, I would fly to, I'd fly across the country go into a room, hoping I could meet one person that was a mid-level person mm -hmm. that'll ultimately lead me to some business. And I didn't find any despair when I didn't 
find, get the business. Mm. So I always felt like even if I went and I flew across the country and stayed in a shitty room, I didn't measure the one event and go, oh, this doesn't work. Yeah. I would do it over and over and over and over and over again, knowing that at some point it would work. And as an entrepreneur, I believe that your job is to look under every single rock. Because you never know where it's going to be at. You never know where magic is going to be. You never know when it's going to take place. And the meticulous nature of going through that process over and over again is what gives you the perseverance to go, to, to go through the ups and the downs of what it takes to build a company. Um, so that grind um, is sort of, it's a baseline ingredient that I have that I apply in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. And it is what made me, you know, who I am as an entrepreneur. It's what made me who I am as a CEO. And I respect it as a very important attribute um, in, in, in anybody who's trying to build something. One of the things I really admire about you is your ability to be a, a translator between worlds. Mm. Because I know a lot of people in tech, obviously. I know some people from the entertainment world. They don't usually talk to each other. They can't usually talk each other's language. And even if this is very conversation, it is very clear that you can talk both languages. So I, I, I think the question would be, what do you think if you are a tech nerd, geek, engineer watching this, right? Or on the other hand, maybe, you know, uh, you're a hip hop artist uh, uh, watching this. What do you think you could learn from each other? What do you think both of the worlds could learn from each other? Oh, Shreem, I, I, I was very early. I'm like, this whole thing is about the convergence of culture, mm. and technology, and storytelling. Mm. I, I, I seen when Twitter first blew up, all of the people, the cultural conversations that were on it that helped drive that, um, you know, the contagion around people downloading the app and the conversations and you know what led to black twitter or whatever it may be and i seen the same thing with instagram like i know how important culture is in driving technology i also know the importance that technology does to culture to make it scale quick, quick, quicker so that people get a chance to understand the rituals and the ebonics and all of the things that drive culture that technology has done to to move it quickly and spread it and make it global uh, and much more the depth mm -hmm. has gone, you know, not just it's gone deep as a result of the, 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 how powerful technology is in spreading uh, messages and providing access. Living in that convergence of culture, technology, and storytelling is what I, I've believed in. Um, and I think that people who don't want to do that are putting themselves in a very tough spot mm -hmm. because this idea of the technology guy being the nerd, mm -hmm. the introvert mm -hmm. that doesn't care about culture or technology, that guy's not a winner either. Mm -hmm. And the cool guy who's the artist who doesn't think, who think the tech guys are nerds and mm -hmm. wants to be so cool, that person is not going to make it either. Mm -hmm. It's the person who understands how to bridge that gap and build a company that knows how to build and bridge that gap mm -hmm. where you can have writers and people who move culture next to product people and engineering people who are going to shape the roadmap and then inform one another. Right. That's going to be yeah. what's going to disrupt and build tomorrow's companies, in my opinion. I believe very seriously that your ability to tolerate change will separate you as a winner mm -hmm. or you as a loser. Yep. Period. And if you are not willing to accept the change, which comes with, the rise and importance of culture, yeah, or the dominance and the, the 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 scale that technology provides, you will be on the losing side of that movement. Uh, I mean, there's so much truth there at so many levels. Uh, uh, but I think people who live at the intersection of domains, uh, tech and culture, is one obviously very close to both of our hearts. But any domains, I think they are so much more successful. And you're obviously a master at it. Now, I know we only have a few minutes, and you have a, you have to run, but uh, maybe one last, maybe deep question. Um, let us see you looking back many, many decades from now, you know, over some whiskey and maybe some ribs that Ben hasn't burnt himself with. What would make you happy about these decades? That, that was like a job well done. What would you want to have like accomplished? This could be both United Masters. This could be a culture. What would be one thing you'd be like, okay, that was great, Steve. 
I, 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 I think it's an ongoing process to take your God-given talent and optimize it. Huh. Okay. That's what success is. I got lucky. Um, I've got a lot of God-given talent. I believe in hard work. My parents taught me those values. As an immigrant, came in from Trinidad yeah. uh, in the late 60s. And between that work ethic by my parents and the God-given talent that I have, my job is to get as most out of it as I can. Um, that's what makes me happy. That's what's fulfilling. Not, It's not a financial goal. It's not a um, what United Masses becomes. It, it, as long as it becomes the most that it could be, because I gave it my all, yeah. then, then I am I'm happy about that. Yeah. Um, that so, it, it, you know, I don't want to be ambiguous with my answer, but it really is about effort uh, against my talent that I, you know, was a gift from God. And I, I believe very firmly in that. Steve, that's a very unique answer from what we would usually hear. Uh, typically, it's about a thing, a company, a mission, moving something forward. And that's usually what we'd get about, like, in the future, what do you see? I really like that your focus is, I have this as like a as like a baseline set of skill set. You know, we think about it from, we both are in technology, the tech is all we've done our entire lives. So we think of it as like the base platform, what do you have? And then what can you add on top of it? What can you optimize to make this the best at what it can do? And you're focused more on your personal fulfillment, personal optimization, personal success. And that I think is really interesting because we don't usually hear that. Yeah. It's just a higher order, right? Like, yeah. it's like, of course, I'm the CEO of the company. I'm the founder of the company. Of course, I expect the most for the company. I want to make my investors money. I want to do all those things. Those are very clear. Yeah. But for me, the fulfillment is how far can I go? Mm -hmm. and, and and maybe taking that company to a certain extent. And then what's the next thing? Mm -hmm. What's the next thing? Mm -hmm. But as long as I'm optimizing what I have, Le LeBron gave a speech uh last night on the ESPYs mm -hmm. yeah. and he talked about what the game of basketball means to him and he and and he measured his success by giving everything I have to this game and not yeah. cheating the game yeah, yeah. <laughs> my whole thing is giving everything I have to my God-given talent and not cheating that oh my gosh uh, this is amazing this is amazing this but is I gotta ask you a question before we get up oh, get up. oh yeah. okay go for it go for it Best wrestling match you ever been to live. Been to live. <laughs> uh, easy. Let me just set this up because I, people don't understand. I want everybody in this pod to know my man is a connoisseur <laughs> of wrestling. We Vince McMahon is proud of him. The WWE, the WWF, they're both proud of him. I just want to say we've been to five WrestleManias yeah. in person. Yeah. We've been to a bunch of other specific shows in person. This man is a true yeah, fan, yeah, yeah. I, I, and he takes the entire family with him for all of these matches. Um, thank you. Uh, by the way, I, I think I sent Steve like twenty-five matches to watch. You know, when he was asking me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so there are many, many ways. Okay, the greatest of all time is always a tricky one, right? You look at technical skill. You look at the story. Blah blah. blah. You look at no, no. you know. Hold on, hold on. You look at the emotional impact that you had for you growing up, etc. Right. Um, and but if I had to pick one, um, either uh, and I'm kind of I, I think I have to pick one based on the enduring emotional impact and the feeling when it happened. So I'm going to say uh, WrestleMania in New Orleans about 10 years ago. Uh, and that's kind of a unique night because that was the night when The Undertaker's streak ended. And that is a huge, huge <laughs> thing. But that's not a match I'm going to talk about. You see, because the streak ended. And the streak ending is like you're the death of your childhood. We were there with 80,000 people and everyone was in shock. Crying. Crying. I wasn't crying. I was actually crying. You know, it's one of the darkest words. But right after that match, you could not say 80,000 people as if they just witnessed the death of Superman, right? Which is what they thought they'd witnessed. So there was a guy, Daniel Bryan, right? And who was this huge underdog. And he had this unlikely match to kind of ascend the throne of the mountain. And it was a very unlikely story because the the audience had pushed this guy forward. It was not Wade, it's not W. The audience had pushed this guy forward and W was like, all right, we're gonna run with this. 
And when he won the main event right after that, and he did the whole S chant, which is his thing, like it was one of the most emotional, like you're there with 80,000 people feeling the depths of tragedy and grief, yeah. but also hope. And you, it's the death of your childhood, but also the start of something new. And you've been a part of it. And I will never, ever forget the moment. So I'm going to say Daniel Bryan winning the championship in WrestleMania right after the Undertaker streak ended. I had to tell you something. You got me emotional just listening. <laughs> <laughs> I got to check that out. Steve, this is amazing. You're such a unique, amazing. Thank you. So you got to come back on the show and do yeah, this all over again. We have to do this much longer episode. This wasn't enough. Yeah. Thank you so much. Listen, thank you for having me. I, I have no problem coming back. I love what you guys are doing. This is great. Married Thank couple, you. you know, having your podcast, talking about <laughs> wrestling and <laughs> technology and music. All right, man, you're doing your thing. 